All right, my dudes, hello. Welcome to the second term. This is going to be the tutorial for the very first content covered in week one. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through downloading the file that you guys need from Canvas, opening it up and importing it correctly into After Effects. But before I do, I'm also going to show you what happens when you accidentally place your downloaded file in the wrong space or when you move it after you've already imported it into After Effects and why that's important. All right, so, Starting off in After Effects, we're going to create a new project, new composition, and we're going to leave this at five seconds long. Now, your composition should all be the same from last term still. HDTV, 1080, 25, 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. Square pixel aspect ratio has been set, 25 frames a second. Only thing that you need to change is make sure that your duration reads like mine, 0, 00, zero, zero 5. Zero, zero. Our animation will only be about two and a half seconds long, but this will at least give us space to work with. All right, once we're done, we'll say OK, and then we need to import the Illustrator file that you guys used in class. Now, there's two ways to go about importing a file. We can simply go to File, Import, File, and then you'll go and navigate to wherever you saved your files to, select it from there. Alternatively, to skip that step, you simply need to double click anywhere in here in your project panel. So anywhere in this empty space in your project panel will then tell After Effects, I want to import something, take me straight to my selection window. All right. So this is now where I select the file. So here's my osnap.ai file that you guys will be using. And this is a very important step. Please do make sure to do it correctly. When we import our files, our Illustrator files into Adobe After Effects, we always need to make sure that we change the option from import as footage to import as composition retain layer sizes. All right, so as long as import as says composition retain layer sizes, we've checked the little option that says create a composition for us. We'll say open. And what it does is inside of my project panel here, you'll see that I now have the file layers. So if I click this little drop down here, you'll see all of the layers in the Illustrator file. And we have my OSnap composition, which if I double click, will open up and everything is here for me. All right. Now I did mention this in class, but to say it again, please do not ever fuck with these files. All right, these layers that you see here in your project panel, these are not for us to work with. This is here for After Effects to reference where this information is. And this is where I'm going to sort of just take a brief hold from the tutorial to kind of explain what happens when we mess around with these layers. Unlike Adobe Photoshop, when we import files into After Effects, we do not copy and paste all of their information into the software. So essentially, these layers, this arm, does not exist inside of After Effects. This information is simply being referenced from my desktop where I imported that file from. So what happens when I move that file? Just to make sure that I'm using the right one, uh, I'm just going to reveal it over here. Uh, it's on my desktop, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it into my download folder and just replace the old one that I had. Now, you'll see that, oops, After Effects is broken. Jesus, what have I done? All right? This is what happens when we move an Illustrator file from wherever it was when you imported it into After Effects to somewhere else. All right. What's essentially happened is because this file is no longer on my desktop, after Effects doesn't know that. It's still searching for this file on my desktop and it can't find it. And that's why I'm getting all of these horrible little rainbow images over here. Okay, so it's, in very, it's very important that when you're working with Illustrator files that you download them, you create a project folder or a class folder and you place it into that folder and work with it from there. All right, please don't fall into the trap of simply downloading it and then trying to clean up your desktop or clean up all your downloads later because if you move that file, it's going to break it and then this happens. Now, the way to go about fixing this is to tell After Effects where to find the file a second time around. And I can do this by right-clicking on any one of these missing layers over here. So this is the only time that we interact with these layers. I would say replace footage with a file and I would then navigate to wherever I moved that file to, and I would say OK. Now, you can see that it's only replaced a couple of those broken layers for me. So rather than try and go and fix every single one of them, I'm not going to waste my time with that. Just keep in mind, do not move your Illustrator file from wherever it is once you've imported it. Import as, 
composition retain layer size, create composition, open, double click on that comp there. All right. Now that that's out the way and we know to be careful with what we do with our Illustrator files outside of working in After Effects, we can dive into the actual tutorial. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is, now that we have this open in After Effects, is we are going to label our layers correctly. In order to label layers by a color, what we do is we simply hover over to this color block to the left of the name. So we see layer name, the layer number itself, and then the color block. I can click on that, I get a list of color options over here, and I'm just going to set the pinky tip as yellow, for example. All right, now layers three, five, and seven, these all end in the word tip as well, so these are all of our fingertip layers. I'll select them and set them as yellow, sorry, not red, yellow. And this way I know that all of the yellow layers refer to the extremities of my hand, or the fingertips of my hand. I'm also going to lock layer 12 because constantly accidentally selecting it is proving frustrating. All the words that end in base, so that's layers 2, 4, 6, and 8. I'll just set those colors to red for now. The hand, I'll label that as orange for this example. Forearm can be purple and the upper arm can be blue. Okay, now from my side, I'm never going to see this in your working file unless you're sort of opening your project file and need help with me. The viewer is not going to see these labeled layers. However, if you're working in a pipeline, if you have a colleague that needs to open this file and work on it as well, or let's say you've closed this file, you come back to it seven weeks later and you have no idea what's going on, having labeled your layers correctly um, in terms of using color definitely helps to make sure that you sort of uh, streamline the use or the ease of this file. So if you had to give this to a friend, if everything's color coded correctly and they can navigate it easily, there's a good chance that they're not going to be upset that you asked them to work on it for you in the first place. Okay. It also makes working with it a lot easier because I can use these colors, sorry, to actually help make selections on my timeline. So let's say, for example, I needed to select all of my red layers. Rather than going and holding down Command or Control and selecting all of my layers separately, I can simply click on the block of color that I want selected, use the very first option, which is Select Label Group, and that will select all of those colors for you. Again, very useful tool if you can imagine working with thousands of layers in a project. If you've got hundreds of red layers, you don't want to go and select every single one of them individually. Okay, so now that we have labeled our layers correctly, and we know where they are and what they refer to, we need to start setting up our actual arm for animation. Now, we are going to be animating this arm by using what we call inverse kinematic or uh, inverted kinematic movement. And that simply just refers to the method where we are going to be animating this um, asset by only using rotation. We're just going to be rotating the joints that you can see have been sort of whited out here for you. And by rotating those joints, we will create the illusion of this arm snapping its fingers. Okay, we'll take a look at the difference between inverted and forward kinematics at a later stage. But for now, just so that you've got that jargon out the way, that's what we'll be doing. Because we'll be animating this shape using rotation, it's obviously very important that in our next step we place the anchor point in the correct positions. If we do not place our anchor point in the correct position before we begin animating and generating keyframes, there's a very high chance that we'll have to redo the animation later down the line. Simply because the more layers you start animating, the more keyframes you start generating, it becomes a lot more difficult to try and fix a mistake later down the line than it is to redo. So. The following steps that I point out to you guys, I want you guys to ingrain in your minds and to follow as a checklist of steps that need to be done before we begin animating. The first of those steps is getting the anchor point in the correct position. In order to do that, I'm going to select my pan behind tool. That's this one over here, the shortcut for which is Y. And I'm just going to move the anchor point for my upper arm, so that's layer 11, into this white dot, essentially where the shoulder would be. Then, before I continue to the rest of my layers, before I start then moving the anchor points for everything else, I'm going to grab my rotation tool, shortcut for which is W. It's immediately next to uh, the left of the pan behind tool. And I'm going to rotate my layer. And I'm going to test and make sure that it is rotating from the correct joint. Grabbing my forearm, I'll hit Y for my pan behind tool and move my anchor point to where the elbow would be. 
and then I'll grab my rotation tool and I'll rotate it and make sure that it is working correctly. Okay, do the same for the hand. I'll select the hand using the pan behind tool. I'm just going to place the anchor point in the center of this white dot and rotate it. Do the same for all of the fingers. Make sure that when they are moving, they are going to be moving correctly. Okay. And seeing as I want to be lazy, but also make sure that my anchor points for the fingers are all in the right place, I'll select layers one down to eight. So that's pinky tip down to thumb base. And using my rotation tool, I'm just going to make sure that each of those layers is rotating around its anchor point correctly. All right. Cool. Now that our anchor points are in the correct position, we know that our limbs are going to be rotating correctly, we now need them to drive one another. And this is where parenting comes in. Now we've spoken about parenting in class, but essentially whatever happens to the parent, whatever action the parent undergoes, the child, the layer that has been parented to it, will follow. So at the top of our limb hierarchy, we have the upper arm. We do not have a torso, we do not have a character, we will not be parenting this layer to anything else. So we're not going to be parenting uh, layer 11 to anything. Selecting layer 10, which is our forearm. We want to make it so that whenever my upper arm rotates, my forearm goes with it. Okay. In order to do that, we're going to select, oops, do that, layer 10. And we're going to parent it to layer 11. So we can do this in one of two ways. We can either under the parent link sort of portion of the timeline here, use the little drop downs available to us. So where it says none, if I click that little drop down, I will then be presented with a list of all of the layers inside of my timeline. So I could parent layer 10 to layer 11 simply by clicking my little drop down and selecting 11 upper arm. That then means that whenever I rotate or move my upper arm, my forearm will move with it. However, if I had 300 layers in this composition, this list would be very, very long. And it would be very frustrating to try and figure out exactly which layer I wanted to work with. So instead, we have a more direct tool that we can use to help us parent. And that is this little snail looking icon over here called the parent pick whip tool. Now, with my layer 10 selected, so that's my upper arm or my forearm rather, if I click and drag this little snail icon, you can see I can't extend beyond the timeline. Okay, I can go into the project panel, but that goes into a little bit of coding. So we're not going to be doing that. If I hover over a layer, you'll see that that layer gets highlighted. When I release, so if I'm clicking and holding and release over upper arm, that means that my layer will be parented to that layer. All right, so we can use the pick whip tool to make parenting nice and simple. So layer 10 has been parented to layer 11. We can see here in this little drop down, it has been parented to layer 11. Whenever layer 11 moves, layer 10 will follow. Layer nine is the hand. The hand we obviously want to parent to the forearm. So layer nine will be parented to layer 10. I'll use my little pick whip tool, clicking and dragging and releasing when I hover over the word forearm. I'm gonna test it again. Rotate the forearm, make sure that the hand moves with it. Okay, this is where that little um, color selection tip that I showed you guys really comes in handy. All of our finger bases, so that's layers two, four, six, and eight, they need to be parented to the hand. So I'm just gonna click on one of the red blocks, select label group, and then any one of these highlighted layers. I'll just grab the little pick whip, drop it over the hand, and all of the selected layers will be parented to that layer. So if I go and rotate my hand layer, the base of my fingers should rotate with. Cool. Then it's simply a matter of parenting our corresponding tips uh, to their corresponding bases. So layer one will be parented to layer two. Layer three will be parented to layer four. Layer five will be parented to layer six. Layer seven to layer eight. And again, we test them. So I'm going to rotate the finger bases. 
and I'm going to make sure that the fingertips move along with them. It's very important that we test our rotations here as well because we need to test that our parenting is working out. So I'm going to make sure that when I move my shoulder, when I move my upper arm, or upper arm, forearm, when I move my hand, that I'm not accidentally rotating something that isn't actually attached to it. All right. So if we've done that correctly, everything has been parented correctly. Let's do a quick run through of the parenting just so that we're all on the same page. Layer one is parented to layer two. Layer two is parented to layer nine. Layer three is parented to layer four. Layer four is parented to layer nine. Layer five is parented to layer six. Layer six is parented to layer nine. Layer seven is parented to layer eight. Layer eight is parented to layer nine. Layer nine is parented to layer 10. Layer 10 is parented to layer 11. Layer 11 does not have a parent. All right. So now we can actually dive in and start animating. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Command A or Control A on my keyboard to select all of my layers. And I'm going to hit R for rotation. And I'm going to type in zero degrees. Should adjust all of them. There we go. So that's just resetting all of my layers to zero degree rotation. So that when I start working with them, uh, we're all on the same number on the same page. All right. I'll collapse all of these layers because I don't need them all open at once. And we'll select upper arm, my rotation, uh, my, my upper arm layer over here. Okay. So with my upper arm selected, let me just get this into a bit more of a bit of spot there. I'm going to hit R for rotation and I will create my very first keyframe by clicking on the stopwatch. All right. I'm then going to move five frames forward. So we're essentially going to have a movement where my arm is going to be starting off around here, kind of in a neutral position. It's going to rotate upwards and then slam down for the finger snap that we'll be creating. All right. So we essentially want to give it a neutral starting position. So I'm going to let it start off at, let's do negative 80. I know that we use different numbers in the lesson, but we'll just use these numbers for this tutorial. So layer 11, my rotation reads negative 80 degrees. Then either using my page up or page down keys, or my command left, right arrow keys on a Mac, I'm going to move to the right by five frames. One, two, three, four, five. What's happened here? R for rotation, created my keyframe, one, two, three, four, five. There we go. All right. Now, before we start the major movement of bringing our arm upwards, what we're going to do is we're going to create our keyframe here, our second keyframe, and that's going to read negative 90 degrees. And this little movement backwards is essentially going to act as our overlapping action. This is our anticipation, the movement before the movement. Something occurs, and then we'll have the arm move upwards. So my very first rotation keyframe reads negative 80. My second keyframe reads negative 90. I'm then going to move to the one second mark on the timeline. And we'll rotate this arm upwards, maybe to about here. So let's make that like negative 20 degrees. third rotation keyframe reads negative 20. Now, if I count the distance or the number of frames rather between my second and third keyframe, that should be 20. So that's 10, 20 frames. So I'm going to move 20 to the right, one, two. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to copy and paste my second keyframe. And then in line with my second number two on the timeline, I'll copy and paste my first keyframe. And what we've done is we've got a slight movement at the very beginning. My arm moves up. It'll come down in a snap, but it overextends and then comes to rest. So that little overlap and follow through occurring there at the end is very important for the, uh, the aesthetic that we're going for. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next layer of our animation. So we're going to go on to the forearm here. I'm going to Go to the start of my timeline, hit R for rotation, and create my very first keyframe. This one can stay at zero degree rotation, uh, or actually we'll have it sort of down here, I think. So let's make the very first keyframe negative 55. Yeah, first keyframe for layer 10, 
is negative 55. Then second keyframe, we're going to be aligning all of our keyframes on top of each other to begin with. This can read negative 65. So my second keyframe will read negative 65. My third keyframe, my arm is going to come all the way in, almost as though we were like scratching an invisible face. So I think that value can read positive 40. And again, simply copying and pasting my second keyframe over my second last keyframe position and my first keyframe to be my last keyframe. And that brings our arm to rest. Alrighty. Moving on to the hand, so that's layer number nine, R for rotation. Let's create a keyframe. And uh, we can leave the very first keyframe reading zero degrees because if you think about it, we don't often bend our wrists and move our hands unless we are contorting or sort of like moving our hands to perform an action, pick something up, write something down. Typically, if we're just moving our arms or like extending and bending our elbows, our hand doesn't rotate or move along with it. So we can leave that at zero degrees. As our hand comes down, I'll rotate that ever so slightly so that I can maybe read like negative 10. First keyframe for layer 9 reads 0 degrees, second keyframe reads negative 10 degrees. Coming up for this major motion over here, we're going to rotate the hand quite a bit, so I'll make that positive 30, positive 3, 0, and we'll copy and paste the keyframes again at the end. So second last keyframe, last keyframe. And you'll see that as we do this, as we move up the list, as we go layer by layer, we start adding more and more feeling, more and more believability to the motion involved. All right. Now, let's do our fingers for this opening sequence here, because obviously at some point up here, our fingers need to overlap as though they're actually snapping, which is great. We can do that. But at the very start, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab layers one down to eight. Maybe for the sake of the tutorial, let's do the bases first and then the tips and I'll sort of hopefully make a bit more sense to you guys. So selecting one of my little red blocks, choosing select label group. So it's going to select layers two, four, six, and eight. I'm going to hit R for rotation at the start of my timeline and create my very first keyframe. And we can kind of zoom in here to see what's going on. This shortcut is frustrating me. Okay. So we've got the first keyframes set for our finger bases. Now, for this motion of our hand coming down, we want our fingers to spread out a little bit. So what we're going to do is with pinky base, I'm going to set that to negative 10. Middle base, I'll set that to negative 10 as well. So that's uh, layer four, second keyframe reads negative 10. Layer six, second keyframe reads negative 10. And then the thumb, layer eight. This is going to read a positive number because the thumb is going to be rotating upwards in order to open the fingers out slightly. So I'm going to have the thumb read positive 10. The second keyframe for layer eight reads 10 degree rotation. All right. Um, then we'll go out to our third set of keyframes here. And uh, we can just do a very basic pose for these. So I know that my thumb is going to come in slightly. Uh, I'm not too worried about the numbers just yet. I'll read those to you once we've got them in place. But this is just planning out where those bases would be, essentially. Going back to the start, let's grab uh, simply by clicking on the little yellow square here. Select Label Group. Hit R to bring up the rotation values for layers 1, 3, 5, 7. And we are then going to create rotation keyframes for them there at the start of our timeline. We can then go to where our fingers are splaying out slightly. So layer one, my rotation will read negative 10. Layer three, my rotation will read negative 10. Layer five, my rotation will read negative 10. And then lastly, for that thumb tip, that can be positive 10. All right, so if I read these layers to you, my second group of keyframes for layers one down to layer eight, 
Um, layer one, which is pinky tip, reads negative 10. Layer two, which is pinky base, reads negative 10. Layer three, middle tip, reads negative 10. Layer four, middle base, reads negative 10. Layer five and layer six both read negative 10. And then layer seven and layer eight both read positive 10 for that thumb. Okay, moving out to the middle over here where our fingers need to be overlapping. So this is where I can pose the fingers correctly. I know that most of the motion or the pose comes from our index and thumb. Um, so what I'm going to do is let's rotate my thumb base upwards like so. Bring the tip in like that. And we have our finger base here. So you actually see I'm going to need to probably going to actually <coughs> end up changing the position of that thumb quite a bit. So let's work with the uh, index base and the index tip right now and just pose that slightly. So let's make that 50, that 65, and then the thumb. I'll read the values to you guys in a moment, but I just need to rotate it out so that it's actually like that. Okay, and there we go. So, layer eight rotation currently for its third keyframe reads negative seven. So its thumb base reads negative th seven. Thumb tip, that's negative 27. So that's layer seven is negative 27 rotation. Layer six, that's positive 34. Layer five, positive 78. And then literally for these last sets of fingers, we're just kind of kind of fold them over each other like this. Doesn't matter what their number is, just so that they're closed over like, like so. All right. So let me read these values to you because I know some of you guys are going to be freaking out if I don't. Layer one, its third keyframe reads positive 52. Layer two, its second, uh, sorry, third keyframe reads positive 68. Layer three's third keyframe reads positive 47. Layer four reads positive 49. Layer five reads positive 78. Layer six reads positive 34. Layer seven reads negative 27. And layer eight reads negative seven. All right, so we have our fingers coming up and closing over each other quite nicely. Then we're going to continue to do what we've been doing up until now. And we're just going to copy and paste these keyframes. You'll see that I have to do them individually. You can copy and paste as many keyframes as you want from the same layer. But as soon as I try to copy and paste keyframes from two different or three different, four different layers, whatever, it ends up duplicating those layers. It doesn't duplicate or copy the actual keyframe. All right. What am I doing there? Come on, C, come on, V. And then we'll do the same with the first set of keyframes. And this is essentially guaranteeing that our fingers all come back to rest. Because our animation is starting and ending on the exact same keyframes, it will be able to loop perfectly as well. So when we play this back, we'll have a perfect snapping loop going on. Okay, so right now we've got the basics for our motion. Our hand comes up, our fingers close, and back again. Now we need to add a little bit of easing so that it's not all happening at once. We'll stagger the keyframes out. I'll show you how to add a little graphic, which would be the lines of a finger snap actually sort of indicating that sound is being made. And then we'll be good to render. Okay, so... With all of my layers selected, I'm just going to click and drag to uh, grab all of their keyframes and I'm gonna hit F9 on my keyboard to apply easy ease. Now, because all of this is happening at the same rate, we can dive into the graph editor and work on the graph for each of these elements at the same time. The only major difference that we're seeing here, what these uh, little loops are here, is these two lines are the thumb, thumb tip and the thumb base rotating in the opposite direction to the rest of the fingers, which is why it's going in the opposite direction there. But what it looks like in the graph is going to essentially be the same. So the motion that we want is, we can sort of leave this little blip at the start. We might sort of play around with that in a moment. But we want this action to be quite um, 
smooth as we lift up and then snaps very quickly in this sort of second group of loops over here on our graph editor. All right, so I'm gonna start off by going to my second set of keyframes here, zooming in on my timeline. I'm gonna click and drag just so that it knows I want to select all of the little yellow squares as opposed to just one of them. All right, my left handle, I'll push slightly to the left. Do the same for that right keyframe there. So we're gonna have like a little bit of a ease, speed up, ease for this motion over here. When we start moving out, we're gonna create a similar looking motion. So most of our action will occur in the middle of our frames there. So what this is allowing us to do is it's speeding up as my arm changes direction and starts lifting up, starts easing into that position. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna push this ever so slightly out here, grab my final second last set of keyframes and we're gonna create a very large peak here, somewhere at the beginning. And the reason for this is we want that snap to obviously occur very quickly. So I might actually just push them all the way up like so. And we've got that little snap. And then lastly, if I just zoom in here, we'll do what we did at the very beginning. I have a little bit of easing on either side of it so that it can come to rest. We might even have most of the peak occur quite quickly there so they can ease into that final position. Okay. And that's looking fine for now. Cool. Now, if I take a look at the motion involved, I'm pretty happy with it so far. I could obviously move it so that my arm wasn't um, moving out of frame. And that's another fantastic thing about parenting is if you take a look at this, I can move the position of my upper arm and it will drag everything with me. But because none, nothing else has been sort of animated in terms of position, its rotation is gonna keep going, right? So I can shift this, um, as long as I'm moving my upper arm around, it'll drag everything with it. And I can reposition this wherever I want it on screen. Okay. Now that we've applied some easing and we've gone into the graph editor, the next thing that we want to do is we want to stagger out our keyframes slightly. The reason for this is at the moment, everything's occurring at the same speed. It's all starting and stopping at the same time. And uh, it's not very realistic in terms of how we would move in real life. So what we're going to be doing is we are going to be selecting all of our keyframes from layer 10 onwards. So layer one down to layer 10. And we'll shift them all simply by clicking and dragging to the right by a single frame. All right. So this now means that the forearm and everything else is going to start moving one frame after the upper arm does. I'm gonna deselect layer 10 so that I only have the keyframes from layers one down to layer nine selected. And I'll shift all of them up by a single frame to the right. Now everything that's attached to the hand is going to be occurring a frame later than what happens to the forearm. Then what I need to do is deselect my hand and have all the keyframes for my fingers. So that's layer one down to layer eight. And we'll shift those out by a frame to the right. And then finally, we'll grab by clicking on my little color block for the tips. Select label group, so that's all the yellow ones. Again, I keep forgetting that doesn't select my keyframes for me, which is frustrating but I'll grab the keyframes for all of my yellow layers. So that's all my fingertips and I'll shift them down by one frame. So what this essentially means is the further I move away from the torso, the slight, the larger, the, um, what would I call it? The, the gap or the interval between these keyframes is. Okay. Now, if I take a look at this movement, this downward action could be a little bit faster. So I might just click and drag to select all of the keyframes from layers one down to 11. Um, and I'll just make them come in a little bit closer. Just so that the arm has less time to travel down. So it snaps down a lot faster. 
And then this coming to rest, maybe what I can do is just grab my sec like my last set of keyframes and just shift them to the right slightly just so that it doesn't snap or pop back into place like that. There we go. I'm just playing around with the keyframe positions on the timeline and just adjusting the speed or the rate at which it all occurs. Okay. So we've now completed our little animation. This is the arm movement exercise. What I'm going to now do is I'm going to shorten the timeline that I'm working in so that it just plays back perhaps even on the final frame here. So I'm going to hit N for NATO on my keyboard while hovering over my very last set of keyframes. That's going to shorten my timeline to that point. And every time I hit spacebar, then it'll play back and it'll be a perfect loop. All right. What I'll then do to get rid of all this excess um, sort of space on, in my timeline to free up some real estate, we're going to right click on this workspace gray bar over here and trim comp to work area. And that will then make sure that our entire animation fills up the timeline. All right. So we've got major motion, uh, most of our major movement down. What I want to do now is I want to sell the idea of an actual little snapping being made, right? So that sound of, a, of like the, the click being made. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come out to where my fingers kind of just over here, I think, where they kind of uh, just before they stop touching each other. So on my timeline, that is one second and four frames. I'm going to make sure that I don't have any of my layers selected. In fact, I'm going to lock all of my layers so that I don't accidentally mess with anything here. And then I'm going to grab my pen tool. All right. Pen tool can be found to the right of the rectangle tool and to the left of the horizontal type tool. We're going to set it so that there is no fill. So I'm going to click on the word fill and I'm going to set it to none, which is the furthest left option over here. And then stroke will have it set to solid uh, color. So that's the second little option. You can leave it at white and anything between about five to seven pixels should work for that. What I'm then going to do is with my pen tool, I'm just going to click just right over here where just before our fingers meet and I'll draw a line. There we go. So we get that one line. Then I need to, because the uh, pen tool can be a bit finicky inside of After Effects, I need to deselect that shape entirely. So I'm just going to click anywhere in this dead gray space in my timeline and I'll go and draw a second uh, line. Do the same, so I'll click anywhere in this dead space just so that that line has been deselected uh, and then I'll go and draw a third one, like so. And you should be left with these three shape layers. Okay, now, we don't need to worry about where we put the anchor point for these. We're not going to be um, we're not going to be moving their position in any way. I literally just want these little lines to appear as my hand moves down past it. Now this is a little bit extra work. This is not something that's required for any of your assignments, but extra effort is always rewarded. I might as well show you how to round this out as a nice piece of animation. So I'm going to select layer. Let's just go with my top layer, layer three. It doesn't matter if yours isn't in the same position as mine. But I'm going to click the little drop down arrow next to the color block for shape layer three. And then I'm going to come to this little um, option over here that says add. All right, so you'll see over there it says add. And if I click on this little, uh, it looks like a little play button, it gives me a couple of options over here. Now I want to add trim paths to this shape. All right, so I've clicked on that little add button trim paths and what happens is a little trim paths option is added to us under the contents of that layer so i'm going to go into that little trim path option there and i'm going to create a keyframe for start and a keyframe for end all right so just by clicking on those two little stopwatches i'll do the same for the next two layers so i'll select shape layer two drop it down click on the add option select trim paths it then gets highlighted for me under that layer, toggle it down, create keyframes for both the start and end. Do the same for my final line, add trim paths, toggle it down and create keyframes for both the start and the end. Okay, then what I can do is I'm actually just gonna uh, collapse all of my other layers just so I'm saving space in my timeline. And with layers one, two, and three selected, I'm going to hit U for uniform on my keyboard. 
And what U does is it reveals keyframes on a layer. So it doesn't matter what's been animated. If there's a keyframe on it and I hit U, that keyframe will be revealed for me. So I've just revealed the start and end for these trim path options. Now, trim paths is um, something that is a lot of fun to work with. You'll see that we've got a start, which is currently set to 0% and an end, which is set to 100%. Now, if I drag that 100 down to zero, you'll see that that is that line that is being um, essentially revealed, all right? If I change start from zero to 100, you'll see that I actually then wipe it off screen. Okay, so we're gonna overlap these keyframes and we're gonna have these lines come on and then disappear. So, where we currently stand, we've got for layers one, two, and three, the start reads zero and reads 100. What I want to do is I'm going to drag or rather grab the keyframes for start. So the start keyframes for layers one, two, and three now. And I'm going to shift them out by three frames. One, two, three. Shift them to the right by three, three frames. I'll move my, uh, what we can do now before we move is we can then just set these end frames to zero. So that's essentially going to hide them like so. So right now, my end keyframes read zero. Moving three frames forward, I'll then bring them back up to 100. 100, 100, 100. And we then have that line being revealed. But we also want that line to disappear again, because if these kind of just hang in midair, they're, they're not going to look as though they're sort of indicating a sound being made. So three frames down the line, one, two, three. I'm then going to set the start for each of these layers to 100. And what that translates to is these lines drawing on and off screen. Okay, so if I zoom out and I play that back, I should have a somewhat satisfying looking piece of animation. There we go. All right. You guys remember how to render. If you don't, please feel free to Google. Remember to render through Adobe Media Encoder, H.264, and you can submit that for your uh, homework assignment. I hope this made sense. I'll check you guys in the next lesson. Good luck with everything else. Ciao.